So it begins with Bach. There was something, there was much before Bach. But Bach is the, is, is, is the crucible of German music. And 200 years later, you hear musicians like Mahler and Strauss saying, I've just gone back to Bach, and I feel totally refreshed, and I can start all over again. Bach is where it comes from. To what extent is it the spiritual content of Western music that has made it so so dominant? Do you think that is a uh, part of Bach's heritage also, because there was so much specifically spiritual content in his music? Um, the spiritual element in German music is, I suppose, a reflection of the introspection of the German character. Given that Germany at that time did not exist, there was no Germany. So there was no national cause to which people could expire. There was no other collectivism. The only collectivism was the life of the spirit as reflected in Bach or as reflected in Goethe. So what German artists passed on, more than a language, was a continuity of spirituality. And that uh, one sees really right the way through German music up to the point of the eruption of German nationalism and then it becomes diffuse. Why has the contribution of the Jews been disproportionately great in relation to their numbers? I don't think that's a question of German music or of music or of Germany. It's a question of the Jews and their role in host societies during the course of the diaspora of 2,000 years. Um, we tend to look at German music in retrospect and say, why did the Jews play such a large part in it until 1933? And nothing, of course, thereafter. And we look at that in terms of the Holocaust and, 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 and every answer that we give is clouded by the monstrosity of that event. And actually, we have to look at it in the broader perspective of, of, of the history of two or two and a half thousand years and look at the relation of Jews to certain societies where the Jews and the host society were able, in symbiosis, to achieve their greatest uh, cultural and sometimes scientific uh, summits. Um, so one looks, say, at the Jews in Spain in the 13th and 14th centuries, where both Spanish culture and Jewish culture attained an apotheosis in a process of cross-fertilization. And that was a, 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 the great summits of music and of poetry and of medicine and of some areas of mathematics uh, in which Jews and Spaniards were able to work together also with many elements of Moorish culture. Um, we look at, at uh, Iraq at certain periods, at Egypt at certain periods, and above all, we look at Germany and what happened in Germany after emancipation end of the 18th century until 1933. And what one saw, I think, was two groups of people arriving at a similar time towards a point of self-determination. The Germans were achieving their self-recognition as Germans rather than as citizens of a dozen, a hundred little princedoms. And the Jews had suddenly burst forth from the ghettos. They were liberated. They were given Western names. They were allowed to possess part of Western, Western culture, which had hitherto been confined entirely to the church. Music in, in, <laughs> in the whole of Western culture was a Christian thing. And if the Jews had their own music, it was private. They didn't share it with the Gentiles. And the Gentiles certainly didn't share their music with the Jews. There was a great peak. There was a ghetto wall that separated them. So these ghetto walls came down in the Napoleonic period. And the two groups began to find echoes within each other. And I suppose for the Jews, the energy was greater. They were exploding out of the ghetto. They suddenly had a myriad of opportunities. And they were, in many centers, the basis of the modern middle class. They were engaged in trade. They were engaged in the professions. A great many of them went into medicine and into law and so forth. And it was the rise of the middle classes that created the modern orchestra. So the, the, uh, the source upon which Western late classical, early romantic, late romantic music grew 
was the orchestra, and the orchestra was sustained by the middle classes in cities like Vienna and Berlin and Cologne and Hamburg and so forth, Munich, where a substantial part of the subscribing audience was Jewish. So the contribution that the Jews made, it would be wrong to look at it just as a creative contribution. It was also a passive contribution, it was a receptive contribution. They wanted this. They loved this. This was to be their new culture. They were no longer excluded from it. And when I talked, I remember I was sitting in Berlin in the early 90s with Bertel Goldschmidt. We were sitting at the Kempinski Eck. And I said to him, Bertolt, how has Berlin changed since you were last here in 1935? He said, it hasn't changed at all. It hasn't changed at all. It's still a liberal, lively city. The, the Hitler episode was an incident. The only thing that's changed is the audience. There are no Jews left. Until 1933, a substantial part of the concert, opera, theatre, audience was Jewish. So that is a part of the contribution. Then you come to the creative contribution. There's a little aphorism by one of the early American presidents, John Adams or John Quincy Adams, I can't remember which, in which he said, I have had to make war in order that my son can study agronomy, in order that his son can study law, in order that his son can write poetry. <laughs> there is this generational thing in which the newcomer has to fight his way into society, establish a, a basis for living, and then seek to make art. So that one saw that in the Jews, three generations after emancipation, suddenly they longed to have something to say within the mainstream culture. And so Felix Mendelssohn, grandson of a courtier and philosopher at the, the court of Frederick the Great, becomes a composer. And Meyer Bear, Giacomo Meyer Bear, the same. They are, they are third generation. And they are, although both baptized, outsiders. And it is always the outsiders who make art because they can see the world from a different perspective. They can see it larger, broader. And uh, it's not just the Jews who are outsiders. Beethoven was an outsider. He was of Flemish stock. Brahms was an outsider of, you know, born on, 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 on Prostitutes Row in Hamburg. Liszt was an outsider, a Hungarian. All the great artists, many of the great artists throughout history have been outsiders. So this is what the first and second generations of Jewish composers brought to, um, to German culture, together with this phenomenal energy, this you know, cork out of a bottle um, of, of, of wanting to grasp the whole world. You know, when Mahler said, die Symphonie ist wie die Welt, es muss alles umfassen. He meant not just that the symphony has to embrace the world, he wanted to embrace the world because he was free and he had something to say. And he saw art from a different perspective from that of, of Christian composers who were part of the establishment that had ruled art for a thousand years. So if their numbers were greater, it's because their energy was greater and perhaps because they had more to say. Why has music been such an important part of Jewish culture? Interesting. Music was part of temple worship. When the second temple was destroyed, the rabbis forbade the performance of music. Um, some of them forbade it absolutely. And um, even in the Middle Ages, one sees rabbis absolutely forbidding Jews to listen to music, even on, on, at weddings and the like. So the Jews had a very ambivalent attitude towards music. It was associated entirely with the divine and hence with tragedy, the destruction of the temple, the dispersion. And it was a gradual process that allowed the Jews to rediscover music, to make their own music, to start listening to the music around them. And perhaps it achieved a disproportionate importance in their own perception because of the long period of prohibition and there are even now, for Orthodox Jews, certain periods where they may not hear music. There are three weeks in the middle of the summer, which is the anniversary of the, the, the storming and the destruction of the temple, where Orthodox Jews do not listen to or play music of any kind. Uh, if one suffers a bereavement, you lose a parent or a spouse or a child, God forbid, you do not listen to music for a whole year. So music is intimately associated with mourning, with history, and with God. And it therefore has a, a perhaps a slightly angular, but a tremendously significant role in the Jewish perspective. 
And what about Richard Wagner? Wagner is interesting in so many ways, not least because of what he was writing against. So much of what Wagner created was a reaction against what he had received. And the two critical influences in his formation were the grandiose, gigantic, bombastic Meyerbeer and the refined, perhaps over-refined Mendelssohn. And he had to write these out of his system and write against them. And it, so in a sense, his music is anti-Semitic in that it has to expunge those elements that made him what he was. When one then looks at what Wagner created, one can't detach it from the evolutionary process of German nationalism. Wagner is writing at a time where Germany is becoming unified. But it's becoming unified not in the way other countries became unified. The other countries were able to revolt against someone. Italian independence came about as a result of throwing out the Habsburgs and, and throwing out the, 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 the tin pot king of, Italy, of, 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 of Naples. Um, the Czechs became independent by rebelling against the Habsburgs. The Finns became independent by throwing out the Swedes and the Russians and so on and so forth. The Germans didn't have anyone to throw out. All they had to rebel against was themselves their own disparity. So their nationalism was a, a, an attempt to bring themselves together, but they needed something to push against. And the element that they chose to push against was the Jews, the element within, because there was nothing without. And Wagner lent credence to this. Wagner and the concentration camps. First of all, is the association between Nazism and, and Wagner's music still a legitimate one in the world? Yes, yes, yes. Um, <sighs> if Hitler had gone to Oberammergau to watch the Passion Play, then the association between Oberammergau and Nazism would be strong. He didn't. He went to Bayreuth. Because for him, Bayreuth was the Fons et Origo of Nazism. This was the legitimation, legitimization of Nazism. When, one say, when I said that Wagner founded secular anti-Semitism, for Hitler, Wagner gave secular anti-Semitism a religious absolution. This was the spiritual element that he sought. So one can't separate those two, and one cannot dissociate Bayreuth from the Third Reich. You know, you know Alfred uh, Rosenberg's quotation statement, the essence of all Western art became manifest in Richard Wagner. Yes, yeah. yes, By yes. By the way, yeah. I mean, Hitler didn't actually like Wagner's music very much. He liked Lohengrin. He, didn't, he, he couldn't bear the ring. He didn't have the Sitzfleisch for the ring. <laughs> And certainly not for Parsifal. So what he liked about Wagner was the ideas. What he liked about Wagner is the sort of blessing that genius gave to criminality. <laughs>